Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to Biologens Tech Talk. I would also like to thank our organizers for giving us this opportunity to present at ACB for the second time. My name is Mohar, and I'm from BioLegend. I'm a product manager at BioLegend. And in today's talk, I'm going to go over some of the tools that you can use to explore bone cell differentiation and bone cancer. So this is the agenda for my talk. There's going to be three parts. In the first part, I will go over bone cell differentiation. In the second part, I will show you normal bone homeostasis data. And then the third part is going to be about bone cancer. All the recombinant proteins, antibodies, and chemical probes used in our studies are from Biologen. OK, so first a quick summary or background information about osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So these are the two categories of cells that are present in the bone. The osteoclasts are the cells that are responsible for bone resorption or breaking down or dissolving the bone. And bone resorption is a natural process or phenomenon in the bone, and it is uh, important for bone um, repair, for bone remodeling, for bone maintenance, etc. The osteoblast cell belongs to the osteoblast family of cells, um, where the osteoblasts are responsible for bone formation. And then the other cells in this osteoblast family are the osteocytes that are responsible for supporting the bone and the bone, marrow, uh, the bone uh, lining cell that line the uh, outer surface of the bone and help in providing the um, surface uh, protection for the bone. Now, this uh, balance between the bone resorption and bone formation is very tightly regulated. And any uh, tipping of the balance on any end would then lead to bone dysregulation and some kind of a bone disease like bone cancer. Now, the osteoclast cells are derived from hematopoietic stem cells, which are further differentiated into macrophages. And then uh, macrophages further differentiate into osteoclasts. The osteoblast cells, on the other hand, come from mesenchymal progenitor cells, which are differentiated into pre-osteoblast cells, and then further differentiated into osteoblasts. In the first part of my talk, I will show you data where we used bone marrow cells and we differentiated them into macrophages and then further into osteoclasts using um, Biologens reagents. So one of the first things we did is to obtain bone marrow cells, and this is a flowchart of bone marrow isolation. So we took um, a C57 black mice, we took out the femur, we chopped it into pieces, uh, smaller pieces, and then we flushed out the bone using our PMI medium plus 10% FBS, and then we collected the cells and enriched them by centrifugation, and we plated them. So that's our starting material, our plate of bone marrow cells. Now, as you know, there are many different markers that are commonly expressed by bone marrow cells, and here are some examples of the antibodies that we use to stain the cells. Um, so this is an example of um, CD200R, and the clones are expressed, um, the clones that we used are in parentheses, so this is clone OX110. Um, and we stain the bone marrow cells. So CD200R is uh, specifically expressed on the myeloid population that is slotted for um, osteoclast um, differentiation. So these are um, spe specifically expressed on uh, bone marrow cells with osteogenic potential. And as you can see here, we had a positive staining of uh, the bone marrow cells with the CD200R antibody. This is a single stain of CD11B with Alexa fluor 488. And CD11B, as we all know, is a very common macrophage marker. Um, so this uh, stained positive for CD11B. This is a double staining CD11B fit C with uh, the ACT2 clone, which is CD117. And CD117 um, is expressed on multipotent hematopoietic stem cells and progenitor cells that are committed to the myeloid population. So this double staining here is um, what is the uh, macrophage monocyte population. So I, again, these are examples of um, some of the antibodies that can be used to look at bone marrow cells, but of course there are many, many more antibodies that we have um, that can be used to stain bone marrow cells. Okay, so the next thing that we did after we obtained the bone marrow cells was to try to differentiate it into macrophages. And this is the protocol for that. So we took the bone marrow cells at day zero, and then we treated them with 20 nanograms per ml recombinant mouse GMCSF in our PMI plus 10% FBS for three days. 
After that, uh, for every three days, we changed the medium. So we added fresh RPMI plus 10% FBS and five nanograms per ml recombinant mouse GMCSF. And we continued that till day 14, after which um, we believe we got the uh, macrophages. So the next thing we did is we took the cells from day zero, day seven, and day 14, and we dissociated the cells from the plate with coal PVS without calcium and magnesium. And then we looked at the confirmation of macrophage development by two different methods. One is we did a flow cytometry surface staining, so we looked at the surface phenotype of these cells, and we also did a phagocytosis assay to confirm that we actually got macrophages. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go over the data for the flow cytometry uh, for both the surface phenotype and the phagocytosis. So this is the data for staining the bone marrow derived macrophages with macrophage markers. Um, these are the cells at day zero, day seven, and day 14. The y-axis is relative cell number. The x-axis is log fluorescence intensity. And these are the antibodies that we used, and the clones are in parentheses. So CX3CR1, CD11B, and F480, as we all know, are um, uh, very commonly used macrophage markers. And as you can see, as the days progress, um, that we have more and more positive staining. So there is a right shift of the peaks. CD64 FC gamma receptor R1 is expressed on monocytes and uh, macrophages. So um, for this uh, antibody as well, we see a positive staining with increasing days uh, as the peak shifts to the right. And uh, as you can see, uh, about seven days, we started to see the differences in the staining in these cells. We also looked at other markers on these cells. So GR1 and LY6G are uh, markers for granulocytes. And as you can see, as the days progressed, there is a left shift of the peak, meaning that there was less and less staining for granulocytes, which is what is expected. MHC class two is present in APC cells or antigen presenting cells. And we also expected to see decrease in staining for this, which we do over the days. Uh, MARTK is a monocyte macrophage marker, um, and it is involved in TLR, TLR signaling as well as in phagocytosis. Um, so we expect to see increase in staining of MARTK, which we see here over the days. <clears throat> Again, there's a right shift of the peak in these cells. <clears throat> okay, so as far as surface staining was, uh, is, is concerned, it seems like we had the macrophages, but we wanted to confirm that with a functional assay. So the next thing we did was we did a phagocytosis assay. And um, as we all know, macrophages are um, well known for their phagocytosis uh, property. So um, we did a phagocytosis assay with these cells. So we took the plate of the bone marrow derived macrophages at day 14. And then we dissociated the cells with coal PBS without calcium magnesium. And we incubated the cells with latex beads that were conjugated to rabbit IgG fit C for three and a half hours at 37 degrees in our PMI plus 10% FBS. We washed the cells in cell staining buffer, and then we blocked the FC receptor with CD1632 antibody, and then we stained the cells with um, APC anti-mouse F480 antibody. This is the data for it. So this is um, cells only staining in flow cytometry. Uh, this is cells plus latex beads. The y-axis here is FITC, so it's a single staining of FITC. This is a double staining of FITC and the APC F40. So these are cells with antibody plus the latex beads. And the double staining here is what represents the macrophages that actually phagocytose the latex beads. So these results taken together indicate that we were successful in differentiating the bone marrow cells to macrophages and that the macrophages stained positive for their surface phenotypes as well as were functional um, because they were able to phagocytose. Okay, so before I move on to the next set of data, I'd like to introduce a few proteins. Um, RANKIL is also known as receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand. Uh, other names of RANKIL, popularly known as TRANS, this is a member of the tumor necrosis factor superfamily, and it binds to its receptor rank and functions as a key factor for osteoclast differentiation and activation. So RANKIL is expressed on osteoblasts, and it binds to its receptor, which is the rank receptor, which is expressed on osteoclast precursors. Its uh, rank is also expressed in osteoclasts, and binding of RANKIL to rank then 
uh, causes the osteoclast precursor to differentiate into osteoclast. So RANK, which also stands for Receptor Activator of Nuclear Factor Kappa B, is, as I mentioned, an osteoclast cell surface receptor that binds to rank L. It's also known as trans receptor or TNFRSF11A, and it is associated with bone remodeling and repair. OPG is another protein that I wanted to introduce. Um, OPG is a soluble receptor, and it binds to rank L. It's a decoy receptor, so when OPG binds to rank L, then it prevents the binding of rank L to rank, and so it inhibits the downstream effects of rank L. So the next thing we did is looked at the differentiation of the bone marrow-derived macrophages to osteoclasts. And this is the flowchart for that. So we took the bone marrow-derived cells at 14 days, and we treated that with 25 nanograms per ml recombinant mouse MCSF in MEM alpha plus 10% FBS for three days. And after that, we added serial dilution of recombinant mouse rank L from 0 to 480 nanograms per ml. And in the presence of recombinant mouse MCSF, 25 nanograms per ml in MEM alpha plus 10% FBS. And we treated the cells for eight days, after which we looked at the cells under a microscope to look at the morphology, and we did a trap activity assay. So in the next few slides, I will show you the data um, for the microscopy and the trap activity assay. So this is the data for um, when we looked under the microscope. These are the, uh, the cells, the control cells, and this is increasing concentrations of the recombinant mouse rank L. We did do several different dilutions, but I'm only showing you the higher concentrations here, which is where we started to see these cells differentiate into osteoclasts. And as you know, osteoclast is a much bigger cell, and it's multinucleated. Typically, it has anywhere from three to five nucleus in it. So at 240 nanograms per ml, and especially at 480 nanograms per ml, we start seeing these differentiated cells. But uh, to confirm that we actually have osteoclasts, the next thing we did was to look at TRAP activity assay. So TRAP is a glycosylated metalloprotein enzyme, and it is highly expressed in osteoclasts. So we looked at the TRAP activity in the osteoclast to confirm that they were actually osteoclasts. So we took the osteoclast at day eight, we washed the cells with PBS, we lysed the cells with Triton X, and then centrifuged the plate for five minutes. Then we transferred 50 microliter soup to a new plate. We added 50 micro microliters of the trap reagent. And then we incubated the plate at room temperature for five minutes or up to overnight, depending on the yellow color development. And then finally, we read the plate at four or five. So this is the data for the assay. Um, this is increasing concentrations of recombinant mouse rank L. And this is the OD405 that indicates the trap activity. And as you can see, with increasing concentrations of the recombinant protein, we got increase in the trap activity assay, uh, increase in trap activity, which indicated that these were indeed osteoclasts that we obtained. So this is a quick summary of what I showed you, um, all the data that I showed you previously. So we took the bone marrow cells, we differentiated into macrophages using GMCSF, recombinant protein, and then we took the macrophages and then differentiated it with Rankel and MCSF into osteoblasts. But as you are aware, many people um, in the field, um, researchers would prefer to just differentiate raw cells into osteoclasts, and there are several reasons for that. Um, one would be if you wanted a uniform population of osteoclasts, it's just much easier to work with raw cells. And the second is, um, as I showed you, there's many steps involved in differentiating the cells all the way from bone marrow cells to macrophages to osteoclasts, which needs a lot of time and resources. So if you want to avoid that, you can just start with raw cells as your starting material. And there are a lot of um, publications that, um, in fact, indicate that you can use raw cells to differentiate them into osteoclasts. So the next thing we wanted to see was whether we could use our reagents to differentiate the raw cells into osteoclasts. So this is the flowchart for the protocol, um, where we took the raw cells, we treated them with recombinant mouse rank L from 0 to 400 nanograms per ml in MEM alpha plus 10% FBS. We incubated the cells for five days, after which we looked at the morphology and we did the trap activity assay like we did um, in 
one of our previous experiments where we were differentiating it from the bone marrow cells. So this is the data for um, when we looked at the raw cells under the microscope. This is the control cells. These are increasing concentrations of mouse Rankel. And as you can see, even at 44 nanograms per ml, we were uh, able to have these nice, beautiful, uh, differentiated cells that uh, looked like osteoclasts. We did go up to 1,200 nanograms per ml, uh, but I'm only showing you the selected um, concentrations here. And um, as I said before, even at 44 nanograms per ml, we were able to see the differentiation of these cells. So the next thing we did, again, was to do a trap activity assay to confirm that the osteoclasts that we obtained are, in fact, osteoclasts. Um, so we used increasing concentrations of recombinant mouse rank kill in nanograms per ml, and this is the absorbance, so the OD405 was measured. The purple line here is the biologin recombinant protein, and as you can see, with increasing concentrations of the recombinant protein, we see increasing trap activity. Uh, and in this case, our protein was compared uh, in a side-by-side -side comparison with uh, one of our competitors' proteins. And as you can see, they both, um, in this case, worked um, comparatively. So they were both comparable in their activity. Okay, so so long we were um, working with osteoclasts, and I'm, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about osteoblasts. I'm still in the first part of the talk, but we wanted to look at some differentiation of osteoblast from um, its precursor cells. So before I show the data, I wanted to go over some of the proteins that are important for osteoblast differentiation. BMPs uh, are also known as bone morphogenetic protein. Uh, these are members of the TGF beta superfamily. They play a key role in skeletal development, bone formation, and stem cell differentiation. BMP9 is one of the most osteogenic factors of the family. Next is the hedgehog family of proteins. So this includes the sonic hedgehog, the desert hedgehog, and the Indian hedgehog. And these proteins are important for embryogenesis or embryo development. And so they control cell growth, survival, fate, and pattern. DKK1 antagonizes wind signaling, and it is uh, implicated in bone formation and bone disease, also in cancer and um, Alzheimer's disease. PTH is a hormone. Uh, it's essential in the regulation of calcium homeostasis. In osteoblasts, PTH promotes secretion of Rankel, and in osteocytes, PTH binds to its receptor, and it promotes bone formation. And then the last protein is endoglin, which is a receptor, so it's a type 3 receptor of the TGF beta superfamily, and it plays important roles in hematopoiesis, angiogenesis, cardiovascular development, and vascular remodeling. So this is, again, a quick summary of the osteoblast differentiation. Um, this are, uh, so the osteoblasts, uh, quickly wanted to remind you that they come from mesenchymal uh, progenitor cells. And our representative cells are going to be the C3H10T12 cells. I'm going to call them the C3H cells. Uh, so these cells absolutely require BMPs to differentiate into osteoblast precursors. And our representative cell line for that is going to be the MC3T3E1 cells. I'm going to call them the MC3T3 cells. And then the osteoblast precursors further need a bunch of other growth factors to differentiate into an active osteoblast. And one of the signature markers for active osteoblasts is alkaline phosphatase activity. So once we differentiate these cells into active uh, osteoblasts, we are going to look at the alkaline phosphatase activity in these cells. So we take our cell lines, which are either the C3H cells or the MC3T3 cells, and then we grow the cells for two days, and then we add BMP9 and serial dilutions of recombinant differentiation factors for three days, after which we wash the plate, we lyse the cells, and then we measure alkaline phosphatase activity, incubation two hours to eight hours at room temperature, depending on the color development. So this is the data for the C3H pluripotent mesenchymal stem cell line. Uh, the differentiation is done in the presence of recombinant BMP9, 20 nanograms per ml. We are measuring the alkaline phosphatase production by uh, using the substrate, the P-nitrophenyl phosphate. So the y-axis is the uh, alkaline phosphatase activity, OD405. X-axis is increasing concentration of the recombinant protein in microgram per ml. So in this case, uh, this is the human SHH, the mouse SHH, the, uh, the human DHH, or the mouse IHH. 
And with increasing concentrations of the recombinant protein, we saw an increase of the alkaline phosphatase production, which indicated that we were successfully able to differentiate these cells into osteoblasts. These are the MC3T3 uh, cells. These are mouse pre-osteoblast cell lines. And uh, we did the same thing here. So we are looking at uh, alkaline phosphatase production in these cells. Uh, again, y-axis is alkaline phosphatase production, increasing concentrations of the recombinant protein. This is mouse DKK1, human PTH. Um, this is in the presence of recombinant BMP9, 20 nanograms per ml. Uh, this is endoglin, mouse endoglin. So this experiment was done a little differently than the rest of uh, this data and the data on the previous slide. That is because endoglin binds directly to Rankel and it uh, prevents the downstream effects of Rankel. So we incubated the mouse endoglin with, rank, uh, with the BMP9 separately in a tube first for one hour before we incubated the cells with it. And so the spike concentrations for BMP9 in this case was 80 nanograms per ml. And then with increasing concentrations of mouse endoglin, you can see uh, inhibition of the differentiation into osteoblasts. So taking together, these results would indicate that using Biologens reagents, we were um, able to successfully differentiate uh, the, the cell lines into osteoblasts. So that concludes the first part of my talk. Um, I'm going to move on to the second part of my talk, which is going to be about normal bone homeostasis. And in this part, we were more interested to look inside the cell, so we did some intracellular staining and looked at the interaction of proteins and DNA. Um, so this is a schematic diagram of Rankel and Rank signaling. So when the ligand binds to the receptor, it signals through TRAP6 through multiple pathways. The calcium calmodulin and NF-kappa-B is the canonical signaling pathway. And this uh, binding causes activation of NF-kappa-B, which translocates to the nucleus and binds to NFAT-C and um, other target genes such as CFOS. And then this leads to osteogenesis, osteoclast activation, and controls lineage commitment. The other pathways um, involve the MEK pathway, which leads to phosphorylation of P38, phospho-ERK, and phospho-junk and the CSARC pathway, which leads to uh, downstream to the PI3 kinase pathway activation. So we looked at many different uh, targets in this pathway, and I'm only going to show you the data for a few of the molecules that we looked at here, uh, and we used uh, either Western blot or chip assay or um, looked at it under the microscope and did a microscope uh, fluorescence assay. So uh, all the data in the second part, we used the raw cells, um, so this is showing nuclear translocation of CFOS and NFAT-C1. So these are raw cells that were treated with or without 100 nanograms per ml recombinant mouse Rankel for 24 hours. So this is without Rankel, this is with Rankel. The rabbit IgG is the uh, isotype control. This is the CFOS antibody staining, NFAT-C1 antibody staining, and then the clones are again in parentheses. So without Rankel, you can see that both CFOS and NFAT-C1 are present outside the uh, cell as indicated by the red staining. And then with, in the presence of Rankel, they both kind of translocated into the nucleus and you can see nuclear staining for both of them. We also wanted to look at the Western blot data for uh, the same phenomena. So we took the same raw cells, treated them with or without 100 nanograms recombinant mouse um, for 24 hours. And in this case, we separated out the cytosolic and the nuclear fraction. Um, so as you can see, uh, 100 nanograms per ml recombinant Rankel, we do see uh, a higher expression of CFOS in these cells. We did not notice um, a very big um, increase in the NFAT-C1 in the raw cells, um, although we did see uh, good translocation in the ICC data. Uh, histone H3 is the loading control for the nuclear fraction, and GAP-DH is the loading control for the cytosolic fraction. One of the other things we were interested in is looking at the interaction of some of the proteins such as um, NF-kappa-B and FATC1 and CFOS with its target genes. And we did this with a CHIP assay. So CHIP is, as you guys know, chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. So uh, Biologen introduced its CHIP-validated uh, antibodies, which we call the GO-CHIP-grade antibodies, uh, about a year ago. And then this year, we launched um, uh, the CHIP kit which is a protein G enzymatic kit. 
So all this data was done using our antibodies and the kit. So these were raw cells that were treated with or without mouse recombinant branchial for 24 hours. We took three microgram of chromatin sample, treated it with the antibodies, uh, and then used a protease inhibitor cocktail. So this was an enzymatic act, uh, activity assay. Um, we incubated it for one hour to overnight, and then we loaded the IP slurries into protein G spin columns. So our kit has these one-of-a-kind um, spin columns that uh, is based on the solid te uh, technology from solid-state technology from Chromatrap. Um, so the IP slurries were loaded onto the spin columns and then washed and eluded, and then we reverse cross-linked, and then we did an RT-PCR to look at the target genes. So this is the data for the chip assay. Uh, this is using um, anti-NF kappa B P sixty five antibody and the CFOS antibody, and this is the readout uh, gene. So NFAT C one. The white bars are the raw cells without Rankel. The black bars are the raw cells with Rankel. Rabbit poly is the isotype control, and with uh, when the cells were treated with Rankel, there the interaction of NF kappa B with NFAT C one goes up compared to uh, cells that were not treated with Rankel or the raw cells control. And uh, we saw the same thing for um, the anti-CFOS antibody. So CFOS uh, interaction in the presence of Rankel increased um, with the interaction between NFATC1 and CFOS increased compared to when the cells were not treated with Rankel. We also looked at NFATC1 antibody binding to some other target genes such as TRAP. Uh, NFATC1 because it does bind to its own promoter and Oscar. And we saw the same results um, where the cells that were treated with Rankel, the interaction was much higher than when the cells were not treated with Rankel. And then the mouse IgG1 in these cases are um, all isotype controls. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the second part. We obviously did a lot more studies, but um, I only showed you um, some of the data that, uh, that we obtained. Uh, so in the third part, I'm going to go over some bone cancer data, and there's two parts in this. The first part is going to be about metastatic bone cancer, and the second part is going to be about primary bone tumors. So a uh, little bit of background about bone metastasis, um, and this is an interesting story. Um, so I already told you about osteoclasts and how they are responsible for bone resorption or kind of chewing into the bone or dissolving the bone. I also told you about osteoblasts that are cells that uh, cause bone formation. Now it turns out that the osteoclasts release a bunch of growth factors and cytokines and calcium, which then attract cancer cells from other parts of the body to the bone. Um, and so the, the cancer cells can be epithelial cells, for example, they can be breast cancer cells or they can be prostate cancer cells. And uh, so they are then um, attracted to the bone. Uh, so they will metastasize to the bone. And in turn, these cancer cells release two types of, um, uh, uh, one is a growth factor, GMCSF, the other is a hormone, PTH. So PTH causes activation of Rankel, and if you remember, I had mentioned before that Rankel can then um, induce differentiation of osteoclast precursors to osteoclast, meaning there's more and more osteoclast that's being uh, made and or differentiated into, and then these will chew more and more into the uh, bone. Um, Rankel also causes uh, the cancer cells to chemo uh, attract to the bone, so they will undergo chemotaxis and they will actually migrate um, and uh, live in the bone. And the um, cancer cells will also release GMCSF, which is again another growth factor that causes uh, uh, the osteoclast precursor differentiation. So as you can see, there's this very positive feedback loop that goes on that brings more and more cancer cells from other parts of the body to the bone, and then it also causes the breakdown of the bone by um, the activation of the osteoclasts. So one of the things we were interested in seeing was this uh, chemotaxis of these cancer cells to the bone. Um, so we looked at that with an in vitro cell invasion assay of cancer cells. So here we plated the cancer cells on a collagen plated um, coated filter plate. And there it was a, it's a double chamber, chamber. So the top chamber has 
Rankiel plus minus OPG with 0.1% FBS, and the bottom chamber has Rankiel plus minus OPG with 1% FBS. And we looked at the migration of the cells uh, over 12 to 15 hours, and then the cells that were actually able to chew through the matrix and go to the other side were then counted using the um, Biologin's Deep Blue Cell Viability Kit. Um, so this kit um, uses risazurine to measure metabolically active cells. Uh, and so we use this as a readout to see how many cells were actually able to migrate through the filter. This is the data for that. So this is human recombinant Rankiel uh, nanograms per ml in increasing concentrations here. Uh, and the uh, fluorescence intensity from the risazurine was, uh, is detected as the y-axis. With increasing concentrations of the human recombinant Rankiel, um, we obtained uh, increasing fluorescence intensity, indicating that there were more and more cells that were able to actually chew through the matrix and travel to the other side. Um, we actually repeated this experiment in the presence of OPG. Um, so this is recombinant human OPG, micrograms per ml, and again, this is fluorescence intensity on the y-axis. And with increasing concentrations of OPG, you can see that it blocked the, the invasion of the breast cancer cells um, and, and prevented it from uh, passing through the matrix. So there were much less cells that uh, went through at one microgram per ml than um, when there was no OPG in the medium. Okay, one of the other things we were interested in is looking at the Rankel rank signaling in these cancer cells. So um, some of these epithelial cancer cells do express the rank receptor. And um, we looked at several targets, but I'm only going to show you the data for phospho P38 and phospho ER uh, by Western blot. So these are the PC3 cells um, that were starved for 16 hours and treated with increasing concentrations of recombinant human Rankiel for 15 minutes. We also looked at the breast cancer cells, but I'm only showing you the data for the P3, uh, PC3 cells. And um, as you can see, even at uh, 200 nanograms per ml, uh, the recombinant Rankiel was able to um, induce a phosphorylation of ERK. This is total ERK as a loading control. And um, again, at 200 nanograms per ml, it was able to induce phosphorylation of P38. Uh, of course, at 1,000 nanograms per ml, there was a much higher induction of the phosphorylation. Okay, so um, this is going to be the third part um, and the last part of the talk where we, are looked, where we looked at uh, primary bone tumor cells because we were interested in to see how the resident cells looked like in addition to the met metastatic cells. So we chose the osteosarcoma um, model and osteosarcoma, as you know, is the most common pediatric bone cancer in children and young adults. Um, we looked at the Haas cells and the 143B osteosarcoma cells. The 143B cells are more metastatic, they're more malignant um, compared to the Haas cells. And the HFOB are the human fetal osteoblasts, and these are our control cells. So, um, of course, one of the first things we did was to characterize these cells, so we looked at downstream signaling. And um, in this case, we used the MEK inhibitor, uh, U0126, which is a selective MEK1 inhibitor. So these are the Haas cells. These are the 143B cells um, treated with and without um, FBS, and then um, treated with and without the inhibitor. So in the absence of uh, FBS, you can see the basal phosphorylation of ERK is very low. And then there's this robust induction of, um, of phospho ERK in the Haas cells and the presence of FBS, and then the inhibitor um, blocked it partially. In the 143B cells, there was a higher basal phospho ERK, um, and then the presence of FBS, the phosphorylation goes up, uh, and then the inhibitor completely blocks it. So again, this is just to show that the signaling um, in these cells was going through the MAP kinase pathway. Um, we did look at a bunch of other targets. Uh, RUNX2 is one example where um, it, is an, it is an essential transcription factor for osteoblast differentiation. And what we saw was a robust induction of RUNX2 in the Haas cells compared to the control cells as well as the 143B cells. 
Um, we don't quite know what the significance of this increase is. Um, that's only in the host cells. So we would definitely have to do more experiments to understand uh, what the significance of this is. But P21 is downstream of RENX2, and it is negatively uh, regulated. So increase of host cells um, would give you a decrease of P21, which was expected. OK, this is the last slide of my talk. Um, where we were interested to look at uh, cell health and the mitochondrial um, morphology in these cells. So we took the FOB cells, the HOS cells, and the 143B cells, and we stained them with mitospire red. Um, so mitospire is a mitochondrial probe. Uh, it is based on the membrane potential of the mitochondria, and it is cell permeant and it is fluorogenic. And then the cytophase, we use the cytophase violet um, as a DNA binding dye to, uh, to look at the nucleus. And so the cytophase um, violet, it is a cell permeant uh, DNA binding dye. And what we uh, noticed was that in the FOB cells, which are the control cells, we saw these very stringy, long uh, green staining of the mitochondria, which indicated that these cells were healthy, the mitochondria was respiring um, okay. And then in the host cells, and especially in the 143B cells, we saw this kind of breakdown of the mitochondria um, where they were forming these punctate, and which indicated that these cells were starting to get sick or were already sick, um, and that there, there was mitochondrial swelling in these cells. Um, I do want to say that we did a lot more um, studies on the mitochondrial um, the, to look at the, the, their health, to look at the mitochondrial density, to look at calcium staining and calcium quenching. But um, again, due to shortage of time, I'm, I'm unable to show that data. So this brings me to the conclusion for my talk in where um, the first part, I showed you how recombinant proteins, GMCSF, MCSF, and RANCL, can induce differentiation of bone marrow cells to macrophages to osteoclasts. I also showed you how recombinant RANCL protein induces differentiation of raw cells into osteoclasts. And then recombinant hedgehog growth factor proteins and receptor protein can modulate differentiation of osteoblasts. In part two, I showed you recombinant RANCL L can induce nuclear translocation of CFOS and NPAD C1, and that the signal goes through the MAP kinase pathway and raw cells. We use chip assays to look at the association of NF kappa B, CFOS, and NPAD C1 with target genes and raw cells. And then in part three, we used recombinant RANCL to induce invasion of breast cancer cells and then OPG to block this invasion. We looked at endogenous MAP kinase signaling in the osteosarcoma cells. And then finally, I showed you um, the data for mitochondrial morphological changes in the osteosarcoma cells. So with that, um, I'd like to thank my team, um, without whom I wouldn't be standing here. Um, so all the data was generated by my team, um, and, and I got uh, tremendous support from my team, both in terms of discussions as well as um, data generation. Um, this is our company here, BioLegend. We are headquartered in San Diego. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to our technical team. Uh, the email is here, tech at biolegend.com. And then we also have a booth um, here, and our booth number is 330. Please stop by our booth anytime. Uh, we have a lot of scientists at the booth with whom you can discuss um, any kind of research you're doing or any of one of our reagents. Um, we have a couple of new literature. Um, we have a new cell structure and function brochure, recombinant protein brochure. Um, we have uh, many different types of posters. Um, and then this is our um, homepage, biolegend.com. And please feel free to connect with us on um, social media as well. And with that, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you again, everybody, for your time and attention. <laughs>